All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I am Matthew, and I am one of the course instructors, and um, I'm working with Alexander, who's doing all of our technology, and I will hand the session over to Professor Impey, and then we will start taking your questions. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, so welcome, everyone. Sorry we're late tonight today, um, but we'll get started right away. Floor's open for questions. All right, the very first question is from an email, Kishore Tawari, who would like to know if you can explain the difference between gravity and gravitational force explicitly, and um, why does it uh, decrease when you go from, you know, alti a higher altitude to sea level? So gravity is the generalized word for the phenomenon of, of gravitational attraction. Um, and then, of course, we have a theory of gravity that underlies our sense of what that word means. Um, so all these words, gravity, gravitation, gravitational force, they're all related and they're all talking about the same thing. And what they're talking about is uh, usually the Newtonian version of the theory where the gravity force between any two objects uh, is proportional to their each of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. That's stating in words what Newton's law of gravity says in math. Um, and so in that sense, you could just calculate any situation you want, whether it's a, a person standing on the earth. So if a spherical object acts as if all its mass was concentrated at a point at the center. So when you're using Newton's law to talk about a person standing on the earth's surface, uh, the person's mass is whatever their weight is uh, in kilos, 70 kilos or something like that. The earth's mass is the mass of the earth in kilos, a huge number. Uh, and the distance between them is the radius of the earth. And so it is true that if you stand on a mountaintop, you are slightly farther from the center of the Earth, and so the gravity force goes down. But the ratio of the distance from to mean sea level from the center of the Earth to the top of the highest mountain on the Earth is a very tiny fraction of a percent. And so it's an undetectable difference in the force or your apparent weight. You muted. Uh, yeah, I am, but I was also having, I don't know, I'm, I seem to be having some weird um, internet uh, slowdown. I'm sorry about that. Um, so, so the next question is from Sandra, who also sent an email, and Sandra would like to know, when was the earliest in the early universe that planets could possibly have formed? Um, that's an interesting question, and we don't formally know the answer to that. As a research question, it's unanswered. Um, and so we're left with speculation. What we're asking really in terms of the earliest planets in the universe is when were the first stars in the universe? Because we think, um, you know, planets form around stars. The complication is that planets are formed from heavy elements. Uh, they're formed from the very small fraction of the solar nebula or the nebula that forms a star that's not hydrogen and helium. And that it's in fact is made of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, silicon, aluminum, and so on in compound with each other. And that's what rocks are made of. So if you go very early in the universe before there've been many generations of stars, there are not enough heavy elements created by stars and spat out into space to form planets. And so the first stars do form before the first planets can form because there's not enough uh, uh, rocky material left over from star formation to make any planets. And so that's a question that could be answered by simulations or by theoretical calculations. How many generations of stars do you need uh, to put enough heavy elements out there to start to make planets when the next set of stars form? Um, it might be settled by observation, but that's unlikely because we detect planets in our own galaxy and typically in the nearby part of the Milky Way. So we don't find exoplanets elsewhere. There have been a handful of indirect detections using lensing of exoplanets in Andromeda and nearby galaxies. But basically, we find galaxies in our back, uh, planets, sorry, in our backyard. So this is a question that at the moment is only answered by uh, simulation and by pure theory. And the best guess is that it takes two or 300 million years for the first planets to evolve in the young universe. So that's two or 300 million years in a universe that's 13.8 billion years old. All right, thank you very much. Um, the next question is from Sanket, who's on with us live. 
Um, is it possible to escape our galaxy if we travel the width distance, which is about, well, they say something about 3,000 light years across. Um, but I, more generally, is it possible to escape our galaxy if we go up or down or side to side? What would that look like? Um, this isn't anything we're going to do anytime soon because we can barely leave um, our planet as humans. And with space probes, we've left the solar system for the first time now. But that's that's all. We haven't traveled to nearby stars, even with robotic probes. If we were to try and leave our galaxy, it would be a long journey before we escaped the gravitational clutches of the Milky Way. And that's because the Milky Way is held together by dark matter. Uh, and it's six times more dark matter than all the stuff in the stars and nebulae and dust between the stars. So um, the size of the galaxy in terms of dark matter, it's more thinly distributed. And so to escape the binding force of our galaxy, you pretty much have to go about half a million light years away from the center of our galaxy. The edge of the galaxy in terms of the rotating disk of stars that we're a part of is maybe 100, 150,000 light years. So you've got to go three times further before you're near the edge of the dark matter distribution of our galaxy. So it's a phenomenal distance to travel to escape our galaxy. Uh, the next question is from Lawrence, who's on with us live. Can you explain what the underlying difference is between different values that have been calculated for the Hubble constant? Are there just different methods of measurement or is there something more fundamental? The controversy over the Hubble constant at the moment is a very interesting one because the Hubble constant seemed to be a settled parameter of cosmology. The Hubble constant is the expansion rate of the universe measured at the present epoch. Uh, it was first measured in, as one of the Hubble Space Telescope's three key projects back in the 1980s. And it's gradually been refined to have a precision of about 5 or 4%. And it's measured by observations of CEPI variable stars and sometimes supernovae in the nearby universe. By nearby, I mean within 100 million light years. And these numbers have always come in in the low 70s, so 72, 73 kilometers per second per megaparsec. But we also have other ways to measure the expansion rate of the universe using the microwave background and more distant measures of cosmology. And these give a self-consistent measure of the current expansion rate in terms of the dark matter and dark energy content of the universe, because the microwave background gives us a handle on all three quantities. And those distant measurements of the Hubble constant have now systematically produced lower numbers, 67, 68 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And that difference of about five uh, in those units, which corresponds to a little under 10%, 7% or 8% difference, is kind of stubborn and it's not going away as people gather more data. So at the moment, uh, there isn't a simple resolution of this. Uh, one possible resolution of it would be if our large chunk of the universe was a little atypical in the sense of maybe being lower density than an average region of the universe. But our region of the universe is not allowed to be very different from the rest of the universe without violating another core principle, the cosmological principle, that there's nothing special about our location uh, in space or time. So this is a bit of an issue, and cosmologists are sort of on the fence as to whether de to declare it a crisis or to declare it something where systematic errors that haven't yet been recognized will lead people to decide that it was overblown and it's actually going to go away. I think the answer will become clear in about the next year or so. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from one of our live participants. Um, oh, oh, my apologies. I got lost again. Um, apparently, so Ravneet would like to know, apparently a mysterious deep space radio burst is sending signals to Earth every 157 days. Um, they've tried to trace this. Are you aware of this? And um, do they know the cause of these radio bursts? Is this a real thing or is this just a story that I read somewhere? No, there is a phenomenon called fast radio bursts. The, the one you're, the question's alluding to is one I'm not particularly familiar with. But the phenomenon of fast radio bursts, which is newly discovered in the last few years, is, is intriguing. It doesn't indicate any extraterrestrial intelligence or anything strange going on. It's natural astrophysics, probably to do with compact rotating objects, uh, which have energetics um, or energetic phenomena that just repeat with a particular periodicity associated with their mass. And so these this burst that you're, being, you're asking about is probably in that category. 
Uh, so these are compact objects that are rapidly rotating. They have entrained magnetic fields. Uh, and they can produce intense radio emission episodically. The mechanism for this is not completely understood. That's a very active research area. Are you muted? Doggone, I'm sorry about that. My mouse is being flaky. I'm having all sorts of technical issues today. All right, back to the questions. The next one is from an email. Um, which asks, uh, I read that there was no gravity at the center of a planet, but indefinite or um, indefinite gravity at the center of a black hole. Uh, why is there a difference? Uh, I think that indefinite means it should be infinite, but assuming that was what you meant, um, yes, the difference is that in the center of a planet, imagining you could go to the center of a planet where there's no way we've made a hole deep enough in the earth to get anywhere near the center, and of course the center that journey would go through magma layers of incredible temperature and pressure. So it's really hard to imagine doing the journey, but just imagining you could instantly be transported to a cavity in the center of the earth, exactly at the center of the earth. If you were there, you would indeed be floating just as if you had zero gravity, as if you had no gravity, because of course the mass around you is symmetrically distributed in all directions. And so it pulls equally in all directions and the net gravity is zero. So at the center of any planet, yes, in principle, you feel zero gravity, the, what, the forces balance out and you have no net weight or zero gravity. The center of a black hole is extremely different situation. It's the center of a highly collapsed object where the mass concentrates in the center. And according to the theory of general relativity, the mass density at the center of a black hole is indeed infinite. That's a cusp, that's called a singularity and it's unphysical. It means that the theory is wrong and the theory is incomplete in describing the interior of a black hole. But regardless of whether the density is infinite or just incredibly high, it's an extraordinarily different situation than being in the center of a planet. All right, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is um, more of a statement, but uh, they would like you to talk about um, wormholes. Uh, so what is a wormhole? What are the ideas behind wormholes? Um, have we found a wormhole? Wormholes are speculation um, out of physics. They're not, uh, they're not meaningless speculation. They're semi-plausible. Let me use that word. Speculation based on relativity and gravity theory, where a black hole is a sort of, uh, or a tear, if you like, or a cusp in space-time, or a region of space-time is excised from this universe that we live in. The speculation is that possibly uh, in some certain space-times, that uh, rupture in space-time could connect through the worm, through a wormhole to another region of space-time, essentially making our universe multiply connected and, and sort of providing a shortcut between two remote locations in space-time. So there's a black hole and there's potentially a wormhole to a distant location of space-time. That's the idea. And you can imagine it and you can do the math of it. But whether it physically exists is, of course, a matter for observational astronomy. And nobody has found any existence proof of a wormhole at, the, at this moment. And actually, it's also even hard to know what you'd exactly look for. So at the moment, it re remains in the realm of speculation, but serious gravity theorists and esteemed gravity theorists like Kip Thorne have written about wormholes and given laid out the math and the physics of them. So it's an intriguing possibility of astrophysics. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, the next question is an email from Tony who would like to know, when calculating the mass of an exoplanet, how exactly are you able to derive the mass from the radial velocity of the planet? Right, so to calculate, to actually calculate the mass, uh, the mass is proportional to the radial velocity of the planet, or the full amplitude of the radial velocity. We just have to think of the simple gravity law. So when you're looking at the, uh, uh, when you're looking at the observations that go into this calculation, what you're actually measuring is the star. So you're looking at a star, and it's a prerequisite of this technique that you know what the star is, that you know that it's, say, a sun-like star. And so you can say what the mass of that star is. Knowing the mass of the star, you see the star execute a wobble, like a wobble in space, if you could see it finely enough in space. But in Doppler shift, 
since you can't, by spectroscopy, you can measure this shift, and there's a periodic shift, and the amplitude of this shift is the same as the orbital velocity of the planet in its orbit of a star. So it's just like as if the planet were the Earth. It has an orbital velocity around the sun, and its orbital velocity and distance I tell you its mass. And so we use the same logic and the same mathematics to calculate the mass of exoplanets. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is from a red unleancher who is on with us live who would like to know, how is it that we are able to detect a black hole? Can you talk about how we use different types of radiation and you know, throughout the electromagnetic, the electromagnetic spectrum to do this? Sure. Um, right. Black holes, if they were isolated in space on their own without any material around them, they would be dark and they would be impossible to detect. And since space is empty, it's quite possible black holes are out there that aren't interacting with anything else or near anything else. And those would remain undetected. All the black holes we know of in our galaxy that are the remnants of massive stars are in binary systems. And that's the key to finding them. Uh, most stars are in binary systems. So this is not an unlikely occurrence that there would be a black hole orbiting a star that's visible because it hasn't yet died. So typically we'll see two massive stars orbiting each other, one of which is a black hole because the star was massive enough to die first and leave behind a black hole, and the other of which is just a massive star, say, near the end of its life. Uh, and by the binary orbit, um, you can calculate the mass of both members of the pair. And if you see that the star is a dead remnant of a massive star and it has a mass more than about three and a half times the mass of the sun, then stellar evolution theory says that that has to be a black hole. And that's really the basis for the 50 or 60 or so really good black hole candidates we have in our own galaxy. Most of them are, they're not very near the Earth. They're not hundreds of light years away, but they're thousands to tens of thousands of light years away because black holes are actually quite rare. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is from one of our live participants um, who would like to know, uh, what are some examples of wavelength regions beyond the spectrum of visible light that astronomers can learn about the universe, and what can we learn from those different wavelengths? So the electromagnetic spectrum is a, it's a set of phenomena that are unified by the fact that they involve coupled electric and magnetic fields. And the physics of how waves propagate in this way by oscillating electric and magnetic fields was worked out by James Clark Maxwell in the 19th century. Uh, and these waves are called electromagnetic waves. They travel at the speed of light in a vacuum, 300,000 kilometers per second. And out of the theory of James Clark Maxwell, it was realized that light, visible light, the light we're familiar with, is just one example of electromagnetic waves and that this spectrum of waves continues far beyond the visible spectrum to wavelengths much shorter than we can see, uh, or bluer, beyond the blue end of the spectrum, or much longer than we can see, or redder, and so beyond the red end of the spectrum. And we have now learned how to detect with electronics and uh, technology developed in the last century waves all the way from gamma rays at very, very, very short wavelengths to very long radio waves, meter length radio waves at very long wavelengths. And these are all part of a unified set of phenomena of electromagnetic waves. And astronomers have taken advantage of almost every aspect of these waves from the very shortest to the very longest wavelengths. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, the next question is from one of our live viewers. Um, science has become very politicized in the United States, especially things like climate change and evolution. Is this the case in astronomy as well? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, astronomy, because it doesn't couple so directly to human affairs, because it's about space and time beyond the Earth and beyond our realm of human existence, it is fairly immune from politics. I mean, that's a very general statement, but okay, in, on average, it's correct that most astronomy is very hard to politicize a conversation about dark energy, dark matter, or black holes, or supernovae. And so I, I'm lucky, because in my profession, politics doesn't rear its ugly head very often. It does, however, when it comes to funding and when it comes to, um, you know, university politics and the and how students are funded and how 
research is awarded by the federal government. And there, of course, as soon as legislators and politicians are involved, then it can get a little political. Uh, but, but astronomy has not really been a political football. Um, it's also not one of the big uh, sciences in terms of funding. It's a small component of the federal research budget. Much more goes into physics than astronomy, and much, much more goes into biomedical than astronomy. So in a sense, astronomy is below the radar. And for that reason, I think it's never really been politicized. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, the next question is from one of our live viewers who would like to know if we have the technology to move humanity to Mars or to put humans on Mars. Uh, the exact question is to shift humanity on Mars. Right, um, so the there's a huge difference, of course, in technology and capability between sending humans to Mars to visit or even establish a colony and moving humanity or large chunks of humanity to Mars. The first of those is probably going to happen in the next 10 or 20 years. Almost certainly we will go to Mars to visit to and eventually to establish the technology to set up a small settlement. And that settlement may originally be sustained by Earth and shipments from the Earth, but there are technologies we already know of to make it self-sustaining or self-sufficient. So we can imagine that in the next few decades. Uh, moving humanity wholesale to Mars, perhaps because we've taken the Earth down a very bad path of its climate change and habitability such that we may not be able to inhabit it forever, that's a, a daunting proposition because even though Mars is smaller than the Earth, it's a huge planet. And the amount of energy and resources and money that would be required to alter its atmosphere, uh, to be warmer, uh, to be breathable, and the temperature of the planet to be hot enough for liquid water to exist and for plants to exist and oxygen in an atmosphere to be created. It's phenomenal. It's not impossible. It's just a phenomenal amount of effort and money. So realistically, nobody thinks that terraforming Mars is anything that could happen in far less than a couple of centuries. Excellent. Uh, the next question is from one of our live viewers who would like to know, um, is there, uh, oh, sorry, this is from Joanna. Is there any way to predict or see advanced warning of a dangerous supernova event that's close to our solar system in the Milky Way? Um, that would be nice, an early warning system for supernovae, especially a supernova within uh, 30 light years or maybe even 50 light years if it's a big supernova. That could be pretty hazardous to life, maybe not obliterating to all life on Earth, but cause serious climate change, serious extinction, maybe a mass extinction. So it'd be nice to have an early warning system. We know by astronomical observation when stars are near the end of the life. And when they're near the end of the life, they go through a crescendo if it's a massive star that will leave behind a supernova or that will die as a supernova. We know they go through a crescendo of fusion burning, of fusion reactions, which take them from the mechanism that the sun uses of hydrogen to helium by fusion into fusion all the way up to iron, the most stable element. And then there's a catastrophic collapse of the core and an explosion, which creates all the heavy elements and leads to enormous energy put out into space, which is the damaging part. Now, we can see a star that's in entering that crescendo, that phase, and those advanced phases of nuclear fusion are indeed very rapid compared to, say, the 10 billion years the sun will turn hydrogen into helium. But when I say rapid, I still could be 10 or 100,000 years or thousands of years. And so it's very difficult to say where we are within that time range. And so the time precision of saying that a star is near its final demise as a supernova, the tolerance on that is probably millennium or so. And we haven't actually found a candidate star, which we think is that close to the death point anyway. So in practice, our tolerance is even less. We can probably say we see stars that we think have tens of thousands of years to live or 100,000 years to live, but we can't say more than that. So in that sense, uh, there's no early warning system, which is a little uncomfortable. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, the next question is um, from one of our live viewers who would like to know uh, what is what happens with dark matter? Um, can it, how does it interact with uh, regular matter or non-dark matter? 
Good, sorry, I just zoned out at the core of that question. Repeat the okay, question. Okay, no, my, my apologies. Um, uh, what is uh, the, 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 what happens with dark matter, they ask. Uh, how does it interact with non-dark matter or regular matter? Right. So dark matter, uh, all essentially we know about it is it's some sort of stuff. And we think at this point it's a fundamental particle rather than being black holes or dead star husks or subplanet objects or dust or asteroids or rocks in space. So we pretty much have ruled out most of those. So assuming it's subatomic particles, we know they don't interact with the electromagnetic force. That's why it's dark. It doesn't radiate light or absorb light or even scatter light. Um, however, it does interact with normal matter by gravity. And so that's essentially the way we know that they how they interact with each other. And we measure uh, that interaction, which gives us a handle on both of them. And then since we can see the visible stuff, uh, seeing how visible stuff is affected by dark matter tells us how the dark matter is distributed. So in the case of our galaxy, the normal matter, the stars in the disk of the galaxy are rotating and they're held in their rotation by dark matter. Uh, without that dark matter, the stars like the sun would just fly away and, be, and flee the Milky Way scene over a long period of time. They would not be bound by the Milky Way. So the gravity interaction between normal matter and dark matter follows the normal rules of gravity. And because it's large scale force with large, without intense gravitational fields, it's Newton's law that describes it well enough. You don't need general relativity. And so, yeah, we can talk about the interaction between normal matter and dark matter by gravity and use it to understand dark matter better. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is from one of our live viewers um, who would like to know, uh, Stephanie would like to know, if, are there online telescopes that are available to us? And I'm assuming she means the public or, you know, students. Mm -hmm. um, there are some online telescopes available to the public. Um, there, if you, there are citizen science projects. Not all citizen science involves astronomy using telescopes, but there is some that uses um, telescopes. NASA has a project called Micro Observatory. You can just Google that, and that's where it has a network of small robotic telescopes that will take pictures requested by the general public. You don't have complete free choice of what you know, objects to look at because these are small telescopes. They can only look at planets and bright star clusters and a handful of galaxies. And then there are other robotic telescopes. Some of these are owned by amateur astronomers, and they're quite significant telescopes of a meter in size or even larger. And some of those have websites where they will take requests from the general public. Often it's free. Occasionally they will make a small charge since they have to run their facility. Uh, so yes, there are a number of telescopes where the public uh, can request data and get data. And then of course, if you're near a major observatory, most observatories, not right now during coronavirus, but in general, most major observatories have public viewing that will not typically let you see through the largest telescopes on the site because those are valuable research instruments and they can't really take time out to show the public the sky. But these observatories all have smaller or medium-sized telescopes that are, can be used for public viewing. Uh, the Arizona observatories are like that. Mauna Kea is like that in Hawaii. And I worked there in the past. Uh, European Southern Observatory in Chile is like that. And, and there are a number that do this. Um, the next question is from Mark, who was on with us live, who would like to know uh, who most inspired your journey into astronomy and why? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, I get into astronomy through physics. So I was a student in London at the University of London studying physics as an undergraduate. And astronomy was just one of the subjects in my coursework, along with solid state physics and quantum and relativity and so on and optics. Um, and I like physics. I was interested in a lot of these things, but astronomy set a strong hook because it seemed like this was amazing to be able to apply the laws of physics out there into the universe to understand the universe. Um, so I had an instructor, a teacher, a professor in the physics department at Imperial College in London called Bob Joseph. And he went on to become a quite moderately famous astronomer. He was the director of the Infrared Telescope Facility in Hawaii and a professor at the University of Hawaii for many years. Unfortunately, he died a few years ago. Uh, and he was sort of uh, a great teacher, and he taught an, a brilliant intro astronomy course for physics majors, so there was math in that course. Um, and that sort of set the hook for me. So I wasn't one of the 
people who got into astronomy through the night sky, because I grew up in Britain, or actually in New York and London, neither place of which is very good for looking at stars. So I got into astronomy through physics. All right, the next question is from Marcus, who would like to know what would happen if a massive solar coronal mass ejection head towards Earth? Uh, what kinds of things would be affected? Like what would happen to electric vehicles and computers and things like that? Mm, that's a good question because people are still working out what would happen because our our technology, our electrical technology has evolved and changed and there are new things that we have in our lives and that exist in the electric world of, of commerce that didn't exist 10 or 20 years ago. The big question is would uh, a coronal mass ejection take out the, the grid, the national grid or the electricity network that runs our industrialized civilization? Uh, and the answer is a qualified no. It's a qualified no because we've never had a coronal mass ejection like the one that happened, say, in the early or mid-60s, I can't remember the year, I think 1965, that took out a substantial part of the grid in northeastern the United States and Canada. That was a, that was a pretty catastrophic event. Um, since then, the electricity demands of the world and the grid capabilities have increased, but I would say it's resilience to this kind of surge, this kind of event uh, caused by solar radiation or solar storm is not as where it should be. And so people who run these systems, these enterprise systems for uh, national grids, the, the electric power companies and so on, um, are wary and they're cautiously optimistic that they've hardened their grids enough and put enough redundancy in and had enough breakers in their major systems that they could survive a pulse like this. But it's not entirely clear they could if it was a really big system. At the level of small electrical gadgets and microwave ovens and electric cars, it's really not clear. Um, some of these devices would actually be uh, burned out or fried or, uh, you know, essentially destroyed by the electric, the electromagnetic impulse that would rage across the Earth if a coronal mass ejection intercepted the Earth in its orbit. We're sheltered a little bit by the, uh, by the Earth's magnetic field and our magnetosphere, but not completely, not from a big event. So this is a real concern, and, and people are still working out the implications in our modern technological society of what would be affected and what wouldn't be. All right, the next question is from Pashupati, who sent an email. Some scientists are of the opinion that Phobos and Deimos, the moons of Mars, were previously asteroids. Um, what are your thoughts on this, and how can we tell if they are or not? It's tricky. Um, I've seen that idea. I would say it's not favored by most planetary scientists. And, and the reason is this. It's certainly possible that there are Earth-crossing asteroids or there are asteroids that migrate into the inner solar system. Uh, Mars is closest to the asteroid belt, and so it's even more likely that asteroids will meander or migrate to radii from the sun that cross Mars orbit. So it's not implausible. And we know that asteroids have traverse the orbit of Mars in history and are probably doing so now and will do so again, but not a huge number. But capturing an asteroid that's moving with a high relative velocity is actually quite unlikely. You only can capture an object if it has a low relative velocity. And it requires a very unusual coincidence of, of angle of attack and relative orbits of the asteroid and Mars at that time they encounter each other to capture an asteroid. Uh, the odds of it happening twice for Phobos and Deimos get even smaller. Essentially, it's a small number squared. And so for that reason, and for the fact that the Phobos and Deimos orbits are circularized or pretty close to circular, they don't show any trace of being captured in the distant past, although that might not survive more than a billion years uh, in their orbits. Um, I mean, the best hypothesis is that they are formation leftovers from the red planet itself. All right, uh, the next question is from one of our online viewers. Um, if the ice giant planets uh, were to be placed in orbit near our sun, would they become gas giants? If so, then uh, when the sun becomes a red giant, will they become gas giants? The ice giants, by which I think, I presume you mean Neptune and Uranus, they, they are what we in other solar systems now would call ice giants. Um, 
they if they were at a closer distance to the sun, uh, that there's no material they would gather by being closer to the sun that would let them become gas giants. Essentially, the process of forming a gas giant planet in our solar system, when we think elsewhere, happens very quickly after the formation of a solar system. So when the nebula or the gas cloud collapses, it takes only five or 10 million years for the gas giants to form by accretion. And so um, moving a, an ice giant to the position of the Earth or an inner solar system position doesn't give it enough material to accrete to get anything close to being a gas giant. So I don't think there's a way you can turn an ice giant into a gas giant. It's possible that in an outer solar system situation out near where the orbit of Saturn and Jupiter are, you could have something that started as an ice giant and then did grow over time to become a gas giant. Most of that growth we think happens early, as I mentioned, 10, 5 to 10 million years after formation. But there might be enough debris and gas left over that it could just gradually, slowly grow from ice giant to gas giant status. We haven't seen evidence of this, but that's a possible scenario. Um, all right, the next question is from Ezekiel, who is, sent an email and would like to know, what is the theorized shape of the rip in space-time at the center of a black hole, and how is it different than the theorized shape of a wormhole? Well, because you're dealing with a symmetric situation, spherical symmetry, the rip is likely to be a point or a one-dimensional object, uh, just literally a pinpoint in space-time at the singularity. The singularity has no extent and infinite mass density, and so thinking of that as the rip, then the rip is literally a point, a one-dimensional object. Um, that's, that's what the theory says, and we don't have a better or good enough theory to physically understand it, so that's probably all we can say about what a singularity is like. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, our next question is from one of our live viewers. Rakib would like to know, is it possible to remove the junk in space that we human beings have created and left there? Uh, I wish it were, and NASA wishes it were, and is trying to stream up a plan for saving us from space junk, but at the moment, no one's got a good plan. So space junk has been there since the beginning of the space race, but obviously it's increased over the years because the only way space junk disappears is if it's in a very high orbit, orbit some of it can gradually bleed off into space and leave the Earth's situation or orbit. Uh, if it's very low altitude at the low end of the low Earth orbit range, drag in the extremely tenuous atmosphere that high up will slowly reduce the speed and the junk will fall into the atmosphere and burn up. So we do get naturally get rid of some of it those two ways. But the bulk of it just stays there. There's a vacuum out there. The odds of the junk colliding with itself or anything else are actually quite small, so it just doesn't go anywhere. Ideas people have had for getting rid of space junk, are most of them are flummoxed by the vastness of space, even in near-Earth orbit, if you work out how many uh, square kilometers it is in near-Earth orbit that you would have to sweep somehow or uh, scan or somehow patrol for space junk. It's a really daunting situation. The density of space junk is incredibly low. People have thought of electromagnetic methods, assuming that space junk is metallic. You could think of an electromagnetic scoop or or sweeping mechanism that could troll out large distances, but making strong enough electromagnetic fields to propagate over large distances to do this has not yet been shown to be feasible. Uh, there's, so a physical scoop, I mean, literally as in a scoop, like a huge light sail that you use to trawl through space. If you do the math at orbital speeds, normal orbital speeds, that would take thousands and thousands and thousands of years to do a significant fraction of the real estate. So that's not going to happen either. Another idea is to blast it, you know, use the weapon idea, uh, use high-powered lasers to essentially blast the uh, fragments into vapor or tiniest enough particles they do no damage. That is energetically very wasteful, very expensive, very difficult, uh, and that's really a non-starter. So at the moment, no one has a, a clever solution. Uh, and uh, there's no current plan that I know of that will be effective and get rid of the space junk. So people are trying hard not to make more of it. 
Uh, the next question is from Marcus, who's on with us live, who would like to know, how do you determine if you have discovered something anomalous or new when you are doing astrophotography? Well, um, it's always exciting to think that you could discover something anomalous or interesting or new, and, and it happens every year. Citizen scientists or amateur astronomers or just people who got a camera or looking through a telescope for the first time can see new things. So first of all, you have to just rule out what's known. And so it's a process of elimination. If you're looking at the sky with binoculars or a small telescope, you pretty much know what you could see with that telescope. And it's pretty easy to rule out um, all the bright stars, nebulae, and star clusters that you could see with that telescope by knowing where they are and knowing what you observe. If you're taking digital images, it's even easier because the digital image um, probably with the software that runs your telescope will tell you the position on the sky of the thing you observe. And then you can look it up in various astronomical databases, which will take you down to very faint objects like galaxies and distant quasars and all sorts of things. So you can look at known astronomical objects up to quite large distances and down to very faint levels in any part of the sky. So if you know the position of your newfound object, it will be pretty easy to see if it's already been known. Um, but then, of course, there's always a possibility that what you're left with is something that no one's seen before. The tricky part is involved with moving objects. So asteroids, near-Earth objects of various kinds, they move on the sky fast enough that there's no good catalog that tells you where they are because they're all moving. There are catalogs of moving objects, but they're not nearly complete enough. And so it's quite possible you could find a near-Earth object or asteroid or meteor um, and that's an exciting thing, but that's something that would actually be brand new. Uh, the next question is from Shruti, who's on with us live. Can you explain your views on why Triton rotates in the opposite direction that ne Neptune spins, unlike all the other moons? So Triton does have a case to be made in terms of its orbit and dynamics to being a captured object. Um, for the outer solar system planets, you're near enough the Kuiper belt, you're near enough regions where there was a lot of debris left over from the formation of the solar system, that there are a lot of large chunks of rocks out there. There are a lot of asteroid-sized objects in the Kuiper belt, and obviously we know there are a handful of objects that are as big as Pluto or the, or the, or the Moon or Mercury. So there are substantial objects out there. And in the interactions of those objects, which again are moving quite slowly in their orbits according to Kepler's law, the odds of a capture go up. So while I was saying in response to an earlier question that it's unlikely that the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos, were captured by near, uh, from being near Earth asteroids or something like that, once you're in the outer solar system, the odds of capture actually get significantly higher. And so Triton, because of its particular orbit and of where it is, has had a case made that it was a captured object. Unfortunately, you can't do the archaeology of this. You can't look back in time to see what happened, whether it formed with the planet or was captured later, unless we had some geological evidence to put on the table. So if we had geological evidence from better remote sensing of Triton, we might have a chance of deciding how it formed or how it got the way it is. Uh, the next question is from Hernan uh, Reyes, who would like to know um, why you, why is it that you think, sorry, let me start over. Um, he says, I'm still puzzled as to why some scientists and even astronomers make such a big deal out of the fact that aliens haven't contacted us. It seems kind of narcissistic. Why are we so worried about possibly being alone in space? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have to say I share some of your reaction to this subject. Um, the the argument, the question framed by Enrico Fermi in 1950 of where are they, um, which is a speculation that since we're unlikely to be the first civilized, uh, intelligent civilization with space-faring capability in the galaxy, if we're not the first, we're probably not the most advanced either, and then it's unlikely that we'd be the only one. And so if they're out there, then why haven't we seen them? Why haven't they visited? There's so many assumptions involved in that that you can see easily that it's an anthropocentric um, idea because it often it reflects on our experience, on our pathway from microbial life to intelligence and from intelligence to technology 
and from technology is space travel. That all those connections had to happen, and they don't have to happen. The Earth has intelligent creatures like whales and dolphins and elephants that don't have technology and won't use telescopes or spacecraft. So I, mean, I don't think ever. And so it's it's very anthropocentric, and in that sense, yes, a bit narcissistic. So I I actually agree with the question questioner um, that it I don't always see why people get very agitated about this question. It's not clear there's anything to explain here. Okay, the next question, there are a couple people who have asked this, uh, but what is the difference between astronomy and astrophysics, or why would one study as astronomy versus study astrophysics? It's not a huge difference, but to scientists, it's a meaningful difference. Astronomy is the you know, study of objects in the night sky, astronomical objects of different kinds, stars, galaxies, planets, moons, and so on. Um, so in a sense, it's phenomenology. It's in its simplest definition, astronomy can be just looking at the objects of the night sky or cataloging them or observing them or describing them. Astrophysics implies something more. Astrophysics implies your, uh, as the word, which is a, com a combination word, says, you're applying physics to astronomy, you're applying physics to the universe. So astrophysics implies physical explanation. It implies physical theories to describe and understand what you see in the universe, rather than just saying that you see something that's there. So in that sense, uh, to practitioners, to scientists, astrophysics is a more righteous word because it reflects the understanding of physics applied to the universe, whereas astronomy is more descriptive and doesn't imply that you understand things. That's not to be pejorative for the word astronomy, because I consider myself an astronomer. I don't, I'm not hung up on the difference between being an astronomer and an astrophysicist. Uh, I notice Neil Tyson always calls himself an astrophysicist very consciously without ever calling himself an astronomer. I used to think he was an astronomer just like I was. But um, so some people type themselves differently too. Um, that's my sense of the difference between the two words. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, the next question is from one of our live viewers who would like to know, um, oh, what is the, the update? Uh, is there an update on the launch date for the James Webb Space Telescope? What's the latest on that project? Until a while ago, until fairly recently, the launch date of JWST was October um, next year. It's not clear, it's clear that that's not gonna be the launch date because since the coronavirus hit, uh, NASA centers have, of course, like everywhere else, been working remote because they can't gather people in the labs and test facilities to test instruments and spacecraft. Now, James Webb had been through most of its testing, but it wasn't yet fully integrated into a spacecraft. So there are some critical phases of JWST before launch that do need a bunch of engineers to be in one place, and that's simply not possible now due to COVID. So James Webb Space Telescope's launch date has been slipping at the rate of a day per day for the last three months, basically, since the coronavirus hit. Uh, and that will continue. It's not terrible because James Webb doesn't have a launch window like many planetary missions do, and so it's just, it's just losing time at the moment, and we don't think this will last forever. So my best guess is it'll be delayed, you know, six months from where, where its launch date was supposed to be as announced a year ago. All right, uh, the next question is, um, several people have asked variations on this, um, but do you think that everything in our universe is connected to each other, including humans and the human mind and the universe. What are your thoughts on, on those kind of um, metaphysical ideas? Right. Um, the only way I think there are connections, of course, is through gravity. Remember, gravity is an infinite force, infinite range force. It's uh, inverse square law. So the gravity force, as you increase distance, becomes very small but never goes to zero. So in a formal mathematical way, the universe is interconnected by gravity because the, every object affects every other object, even if by a minute amount when they're very far away or very small. As for more metaphysical definitions of the universe being interconnected, I don't tend to subscribe to them because I'm trained as a physicist, so I look for physical mechanisms or I look for 
phenomena that can be understood in terms of the laws of physics as we know them. And I haven't yet seen manifestations of interconnectedness in the universe that go beyond the laws of physics I know of and I was taught. So at the moment, I have not felt the need to reach for metaphysical ideas of interconnectedness in the universe. I like it as a metaphorical idea in the sense we're made of stardust and so we are intimately connected with the history of the universe through the creation of heavy elements in stars uh, and our atoms will go on to be part of another cosmic story after we die. But that's the only sense in the interconnectedness. I don't have a more metaphysical understanding of it. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Ethan who's on with us live, who would like to know, do you know anything about the Great Attractor? Yes, the Great Attractor. I know all the, the so-called seven samurai, the st astronomers who, uh, from the University of California system and a few other places that published papers now actually in the 80s, I think mid to late 1980s, that talked about a large mass concentration at a distance of a couple of hundred million light years from the Earth that was, at the time, larger mass concentration of galaxies like a supercluster than should have been allowed by the gravity theory applied to matter concentrating over cosmic time. Uh, it had a mass of about 10 to the power 16 times the mass of the sun. Uh, and if you think of that, that's 10,000 trillion solar masses of stuff distributed in thousands of galaxies. And the way this group found the thing that they called its great attractor was that it was pulling on galaxies on the front side of it, making them go away from us in the Hubble expansion faster than the Hubble expansion would predict. And it was pulling galaxies on the back side of it in towards it, making them go slower than the Hubble expansion would predict. And so it was by deviations in the Hubble flow or the Hubble expansion of galaxies that's normally very smooth and linear that caused them to infer this large mass concentration. They were working with limited galaxy surveys, surveys with hundreds or only a couple of thousand galaxies. As the galaxy surveys got better, evidence for the great attractor ebbed, and the mass of the great attractor ebbed, and its influence on astrophysics and the literature ebbed. Uh, I don't think it completely went away. The, the objects they saw, the galaxies they saw, were real. Um, but they weren't distributed in a single physical bound object that causes problems for cosmology in that it's an unprecedented mass or it's an unprecedented scale. So that sort of, uh, that story gradually faded away. All right, uh, the next question is from Shreesh who would like to know, um, are there any discoveries in quantum mechanics that affect or might affect our understandings of the universe? Um, well, the most intriguing one, I suspect, is entanglement. So in quantum mechanics or quantum theory, one of the most exciting phenomena um, of the last few decades is the demonstration of quantum entanglement. We already knew, we had an idea that quantum entanglement existed. Quantum entanglement is the instantaneous uh, and coherent preservation of information across on a scale larger than an atom. That's the simplest way of putting it. Uh, so rather, we used to think that quantum states were quantum states and you could have multiple atoms and or electrons or particles and they would have their own quantum states, but we never thought there could be coherent uh, connection of quantum information across a significant distance. It was the theory of entanglement was worked out in the 1980s actually. Demonstration of entanglement happened a decade or so later and now Entanglement has been demonstrated on scales almost the size of the Earth. And people are reaching, and there have been a couple of very clever indirect papers trying to argue that you could potentially detect entanglement on the scale of galaxies. That would be a game changer. That would be very exciting and very a kind of wild result. Um, and so that would by far and away be the most exciting thing I can think of in quantum theory that relates to the universe. But those galaxy scale manifestations of entanglement, I, I've never seen demonstration of one that's convincing, so it's speculation at this point. But we, once you've demonstrated that phenomena that you thought only applied on scales much smaller than an atom actually apply on scales the size of the Earth, then I guess all bets are off. It's an interesting thing to investigate. 
Uh, the next question is from Elise, who would like to know, what are some ways to boost my chances at being spotted or picked for a job as a NASA astronaut? Wow, that's a hard job. And obviously, I'm not well equipped to, uh, to comment because I never made it myself. Well, I never applied. I'm a, I'm a Brit, so I would have had to apply through the European program. Uh, I, I did know some friends when I was a postdoc who were astronomy students, grad students and postdocs. Um, who applied and so one person I knew at Caltech at the time got to the final cut That's the down select from 50 to 10 or so who actually become astronauts That's pretty rough to go from the stages that involve tens of thousands of people down to 50 and then get cut at the last Opportunity and that that means you get cut. You're not even in the astronaut program waiting for your turn So I, I don't want to be discouraging, but the statistics are rather poor now, the statistics have got better because of the private space program. So it's not just NASA anymore. It's not just the Russian space program. You'd have to have a Russian connection to have a shot there. And I, I don't think if you were born, weren't born in Russia, you could ever uh, really be part of their program. Chinese have their own space program, and the Europeans do. So each of those programs recruit astronauts. And, and now I think, I don't know the exact number, so this is not a... I'm not claiming this is accurate, but I think of order 17 or 18 or more countries are represented by astronauts now. It's, pro it's probably a larger number than that. 600 or so have been in Earth orbit. Um, the private space program is going to open up the box on that because uh, as uh, SpaceX and Blue Origin start to put astronauts into orbit, and we just saw SpaceX um, do that for the first time, first time a private vehicle has put astronauts, in this case two Americans, into Earth orbit, uh, that's a game changer. And so in, out into the future, uh, this capacity of the private space sector to put astronauts in orbit uh, is going to increase the gene pool of those people substantially, maybe by an order of magnitude. So I'd say your odds are starting to get a lot better. Um, I would look hard on uh, SpaceX and Blue Origin's website to see how they're choosing their future astronauts. Now, in the first SpaceX launch, the one of just a few weeks ago, they, they put up two NASA astronauts. So they were partnering with NASA and just used astronauts already in the program. But in the future, I'm sure people that are not formal NASA astronauts will be uh, launched into space. All right. The next question is from one of our live viewers. And Munish would like to know, can you please elaborate on the concept of time dilation? So time dilation is an effect of relativity, uh, special relativity, Einstein's theory, um, that explains what happens close to the speed of light and the weird effects there, and postulates that the speed of light is an absolute limit. And by having the speed of light as an absolute limit for transfer of information or speed of any particle, then uh, strange things happen as you approach the speed of light. One of the things that happens is uh, the mass increases. So as particles move or objects move closer to the speed of light, their mass increases, which increases their inertial mass, their resistance to change in motion, and that's essentially to describe why they never reach the speed of light. Also, if an object has a physical size, then its dimension in the direction of motion shrinks. That's the Lorentz contraction, uh, and that effect has been observed too. And as the speed of light is approached, that contraction can be extreme. The other thing that happens, the third thing, is that time is affected. And the time dilation, dilation means running slower, means that time slows down as you approach the speed of light. So as seen by an outside observer, someone carrying a clock moving closer and closer to the speed of light, that clock would appear to keep slower and slower time until, in principle, as they reach the speed of light, the clock would stop entirely. Time stands still. Now this clock effect has been observed with uh, fundamental particles in terms of their decay life, because they don't really have physical clocks to do this. Um, so time dilation is a real effect of relativity. It's been confirmed, uh, and it's quite a bizarre effect of physics. All right. Um, the next question is from one of our live viewers, Annie, who would like to know, is the detection of gravitational waves important, and why is it? Yes, gravitational waves, when first detected, I think the signal was first seen in 2015 and the discovery announced in 2016, Nobel Prize awarded soon after. The detection of gravitational waves was huge because these 
are essentially the last major phenomenon predicted by general relativity, a theory from 1916. All the other predictions of general relativity have been affirmed, many within a decade or so, or a few decades of the theory being published. But gravity, gravitational waves or gravity waves had not been seen. They've been indirectly detected uh, in compact remnants in binary systems where the orbits of the objects were changed and the inference was that they'd lost energy by the release of gravitational waves. But that's an indirect detection. Nobel Prize was actually awarded for this uh, several decades ago. But the direct detection of gravity waves depended on the mergers of black holes and the laser interferometric gravity observatory, or LIGO. It's a game changer because it's opened up a whole new realm of observing gravity. It's as if we had gravity eyes, because for the whole history of astronomy until 2016, we'd only able, been able to see electromagnetic radiation from space in various forms, and that was all we knew about the universe. With gravitational waves, independent of light or electromagnetic waves, we can actually see mass phenomena in the universe changing by the ringing effects that pass through space-time at the speed of light. So it's a really dramatic phenomena, and it's, a, it's an entirely new field of physics and astronomy. Thank you, Chris. Uh, this is going to be our last question for the day. Um, Malik um, is on with us live and would like to know, is space elastic? And if so, then how elastic is it? How much does it stretch? Well, it depends what you mean by space being elastic, but if you mean can space-time distort and stretch, then the answer is yes, because um, we know that space-time is bent by mass energy. That is the gist of general relativity. So in that sense, uh, space and time do stretch. And as I mentioned, physical objects moving close to the speed of light also stretch, or rather they compress in the direction of motion. So that's another sense in which space is distorted or, or, or uh, compressed at very fast speeds. So yes, in the sense of large mass concentrations, space-time is stretched and distorted and given curvature and can be pinched off from the rest of the universe. That's what a black hole is. Uh, and this is a bizarre phenomenon because Newton's theory of gravity held that space was completely and perfectly described by Euclid, by linear uh, light traveling in straight lines, the space grid in three dimensions laid out with imaginary grid marks in three dimensions that were completely linear and smooth. So relativity gives us an entirely different view of space and the suppleness of space. Thanks for that question and for all of them today. Very good questions and we'll be announcing our next couple of sessions and be back with you next week sometime. Thanks, everyone, and thanks to Matthew and Alexander for facilitating.